so um, today's uh, sponsors are about uh, laboratories um, and I would like uh, Dr. Mathul Hetiarchi to uh, start the session. Thanks, Samishka, for that kind introduction. Um, first of all, I'll uh, run through a small case scenario to start with. This is a common case scenario that you might encounter during day-to-day -day practice. It's a two-year-old boy having normal growth, had passed stools on the day one of birth, and there was no history of any drug intake and developmentally normal child. The stool frequency has little changed to three to four days, uh, once in three to four days. And this has progressed to about once in seven to eight days in time to go. And later on, the child is passing two large stools. So this is the initial presentation that most of the babies with constipation uh, will come to you. So the next step is that the, <clears throat> the child will get a severe pain on defecation. So at this stage, the child is developing some kind of a psychological impact because of the constipation. And in the next stage, the child develops painful defecation. The painful defecation goes on to a vicious cycle uh, to have voluntary withholding. What is called voluntary withholding, we'll discuss a little later. And then uh, the rectum gets more and more distended this stool and the fecal stasis happens and the, the fluid is reabsorbed and uh, the consistency becomes harder and harder. So this brings in more pain in defecation and there is the vicious cycle continues. So this is the stage that the child develops severe psychological impact. So initially the child is not psychologically uh, upset about this but later on the child is psychologically upset and, and that part is actually very difficult to break uh, when you treat pediatric constipation. So actually what brings up the initial uh, changes is a uh, few things. One is the diet and the other thing is changes in the routine of the child and stressful event may be a family event or related to the child or uh, most importantly sometimes uh, improper toilet training. So the withholding behavior is very common and they get complications of constipation. So what they do is they stand on defecation and they cross the ankle sometimes if they, are, if they are sitting and it stiffens the body so that they can push the, the fecal matter back to the colon and they will be flushed, sitting, crying and they hide uh, during defecation. So all these symptoms will be there in a child who has got withholding behavior. So this brings in severe fear in the child and anxiety uh, when it comes to defecation. So they always try to uh, delay defecation and goes into a, um, a more uh, complicated situation. So as a child continues to have this problem, the rectum becomes more and more distended. So this brings in the next complication that is called overflow incontinence. That means the, the child is passing stool without sensation and there is no control. And the, the parents also started, start worrying about this symptom because uh, you can't send the child to school or preschool because the child is always having soily. And uh, this is all. This is all because there is maybe minimal rectal stimulation when they want to pass stools, so they don't feel urge to defecate. So when there is overflow incontinence, so they lose the urge to defecation, and that is a serious complication in constipation. So if you examine a child like this, you might see abdomen is not distended. And you can feel the fecal it's in the abdomen mostly on the left side and if you inspect the anal area there will be normal portion of the anus and no tags uh, they, the anal reflexes are present and there will be soiling in the undergarments 
if you do a rectal examination the sphincter tone will be normal there will be hard uh, fecal matter in the rectum and uh, the other sign that you might you will not see is that gush of air or stool when you take the finger out so this is classically present in Hirschsprung's disease so when you do a PR examination in a child and if you get gush of air or fecal matter when you take the finger out that is not functional constipation that you are dealing with so be careful of a patient like that you may have to investigate further for uh, other pathology so if you conscious all this into uh, one that is functional constipation that we are dealing with so onset usually after one year of age and you can feel the fecalates with solid behavior normal growth and no enterocolitis that is no infections in the colon so ultimately the child has developed functional constipation with soil so this is when you consider pediatric constipation 95 percent of children will have functional constipation only five percent will have other pathologies uh, but it's uh, important to recognize other other problems otherwise these problems can get missed and can have disastrous consequences. So now this is the criteria uh, to diagnose constipation, functional constipation in children. It was revised Rome 4 criteria in 2016. But actually this criteria when you get patients, usually they are well beyond this criteria. They, are, they have established constipation. You don't have to even look at this criteria to diagnose constipation. Maybe subtle cases you might have to refer these guidelines to diagnose constipation but by the time the patient comes to you, the patient is overtly disturbed with constipation and the diagnosis is obvious. Uh, Vistel stool chart is actually, uh, you can use this as a guide to diagnose constipation because most of the children will have hard stools uh, on presentation. So type 1 and two, type 1 and type 2 in crystal stool chart signifies that there is constipation. So uh, this actually, this chart can be used in primary care sitting uh, to get an idea what the objective idea of what the stool is looking like because sometimes when parents say that they have their child is constipated, if you actually look into this chart, the child may not be constipated. So it's really important in those cases to refer to this chart and see uh, what type of stool is the child is passing. Now on the other hand, sometimes you might get a patient less than one year old, maybe at six months, otherwise healthy child comes with constipation. But this is sometimes you can't really name this as functional constipation straight away. In those occasions you have to consider other causes. So these causes actually are not very common in our setting, but hypothyroidism we occasionally see. Congenital megacolon is Hirschsprung disease. And cystic fibrosis, celiac disease are pretty rare. Now actually celiac disease is becoming little more common nowadays. So even though we don't uh, positively diagnose this, uh, but we should think about that if we can't manage functional constipation with laxatives. But one other important aspect of this is uh, at a six month old baby, usually that is the weaning period, the patient, the dietary supplementation is going to change to solid food. So that brings up constipation. And uh, that is something you have to keep in mind. Uh, so you can treat with some laxatives at the beginning. But uh, on the other hand, you have to sort of uh, keep uh, these causes, the other causes of constipation back in your mind because sometimes you may be dealing with these problems. Um, uh, actually, this is a long list but if you take few cases that are uh, related to our setting, hypothyroidism, celiac disease, Hirschsprung disease, anatomical causes like anorectal malformations, external compression by mass and dietary protein allergy. So these causes are commonly encountered in our setting, so it's better to remember these few 
cause uh, Sensi uh, whether the child is having these problems, especially Hirschsprung's disease and anatomical causes of anorectal malformations and uh, external compression by pelvic mass. So the first picture shows a girl with a abnormal anus actually by uh, if you just look at this you might think this is normal anus because the child is passing stools and there is no constipation during the breastfeeding time but this is very abnormal anus and it's very close to the vagina and this is a anorectal malformation so commonly missed in our setting so always if a baby comes less than one year it's better to examine the perineum and see uh, whether there is any abnormality in the anus and at the same time uh, pelvic masses sometimes you can't if you don't feel the abdomen properly you might not detect this uh, if you treat this as functional constipation style you will get uh, this mass if it is malignant uh, metastasized by the time it was detected so it's really important to detect this kind of abnormality feel the abdomen all days when the child comes with constipation and see if they are dealing with something else and the Hirschsprung disease is actually a fairly common problem in our setting even though we don't have much data the prevalence about the prevalence of this but there are significant differences between functional constipation and Hirschsprung disease it's really good to know this because the Hirschsprung is actually much more common than a pelvic mass so um, now the meconium history is what we are dealing with most of the time if the child the baby has passed meconium within first 48 hours of delivery that means uh, it's very unlikely to have Hirschsprung and uh, if the onset is beyond infants it's most of the time uh, functional constipation but Hirschsprung babies they present most of them will present at birth and large caliber stool is very characteristic of uh, functional constipation and it's rare in Hirschsprung's and the fecal soiling is what we see in constipation functional constipation but in Hirschsprung when they get constipation that they, they can have spurious diarrhea that is actually due to uh, uh, enterocolitis that they develop and abdominal distension so that is one sign that you should you should look at when the child comes with the uh, constipation sometimes the mother says that the child is uh, abdomen is bloated in the night and in the morning it settles so but this tension is very intermittent but still we have to investigate for Hirschsprung disease because this tension is common in Hirschsprung disease and return to your posturing that means standing up and the holding proceed holding uh, posturing is not there in Hirschsprung's so and the failure to try which is very common problem in uh, Hirschsprung disease so it's really important to differentiate this when a baby comes with uh, constipation so actually to do that you need to remember the red flag signs so red flag signs are the ones that we uh, always look for when we try to differentiate between pediatric and adult uh, sorry pediatric functional constipation and other causes so out of this actually uh, we have mentioned most of the things uh, uh, and uh, one thing we should uh, remember here is uh, bilious vomiting also comes along with uh, Hirschsprung disease when they are obstructed and on the other hand in the, in the physical examination abdominal distension and always uh, for spine always feel the spine for any spinal disruption because that uh, can contribute for uh, constipation so that is not functional constipation so there is a reason for that so that's why we need to remember red flag signs when it comes to constipation or actually if you look at the pathophysiology <coughs> of constipation then you can understand how to prevent that so all these most of these factors except for genetic causes others are actually environmental and dietary habits which contributes to constipation so any child with the behavioral problems like autism and ADHD they are more prone to get constipation and the stressful life events like child abuse trauma stress all that can contribute 
and psychological disorders sometimes really can contribute and uh, parental factors uh, most of the occasions we see over protection by the parents which can lead to stress in the child and can cause constipation and importantly lifestyle fact factors dietary factors and fluid intake obesity and less physical activity all these things can contribute for uh, pediatric constipation that, that is why it's interrelated, interrelated problems between, between the brain and the gut which produces this problem and uh, so as I said uh, prevention is the one we should look for when it comes to constipation uh, because the, the diet is, is significantly contributing for this so if you take an infant uh, sometimes the formula is uh, the breastfeed is changed or the formula which brings which can uh, cause constipation and at the beginning we introduce solids uh, that is at that time also they can develop constipation and importantly cow's milk allergy uh, if you don't think about that we might not discover that problem so cow's milk allergy also uh, significantly can contribute for constipation and uh, low intake of fiber and liquids and now uh, in our city we commonly see viral illnesses contributing for short uh, like acute constipation that, that is also fairly common uh, so at those occasions we should treat it aggressively so that the child will not develop into a fearful psychosis about uh, defecation and uh, in the adolescence of course you should look for eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and bulimia and uh, uh, prevent obesity because that contributes for less activity and then can predispose for uh, functional constipation. So treatment wise, the first thing is counseling. We should explain what the real problem the patient is having and then uh, start treatment. And pediatric constipation, we treat for long time. Short term medications are not going to be useful in pediatric constipation. We have to treat it for a long time, at least three to six months, or so even beyond that, and identify the uh, factors that could could have led to uh, functional constipation. And uh, now, this toilet habiting is very important when it comes to pediatric practice. Uh, if a child is not uh, uh, toilet trained, we should advise them how to do the toilet training and uh, regular sitting in the toilet is very important especially after meals and initially if you want to get the habit into the child uh, do this even three times a day uh, after the main meals ask the patient to sit in the toilet and uh, then never embarrass or punish the child for accidents so uh, uh, when you are when you're actually doing the toilet training uh, not to do any kind of punishment by verbally or physically uh, overall if you take the management we first consider non-pharmacological therapy that is dietary intervention education and behavioral interventions but most of the children when they come in they have fecal infection that means the rectum is full of feces so when there is fecal infection we should disinfect first before starting the treatment so disinfection is uh, most of the occasions we do with enemas so polyethylene glycol what is called heat drug that is available in the wards so that is the disinfection that we do in the wards and once the disinfection is done only we should start maintenance treatment with laxatives now uh, so there are several groups of laxatives available but uh, what we prefer to start at the beginning is uh, osmotic laxatives like lactulose or uh, we call or polyethylene glycol then if it is not settling only we should uh, uh, go back to um, stimulant laxatives but is always we should if the child is impacted we should do disinfection and then treat with laxatives so in the non-drug treatment as i told uh, dietary habits uh, because most of the children will have less fiber diet but we should not try to have over um, over enthusiastic introduction of fiber that means 
more than normal required we should not give to the child because that can actually impact on the nutrition so normal fiber diet is what is required and fluid also the normal maintenance requirement not to overload with fluid and uh, avoid certain food like fat sugar fast foods fried food uh, sweet drinks all these can contribute so the problem is and they have constipation if you avoid this food they will not be back to normal we have to treat with medications but at the same time a recurrence relapse can be avoided with the avoidance of this this uh, uh, food uh, and uh, and behavior therapy of course education of the parents and toilet training so uh, <clears throat> as i told before we should do fecal disinfection first and then uh, start maintenance but when you start maintenance therapy we should never stop it uh, abruptly we should continue it until the patient is able to pass tools on their own that means they have normal habit developed some babies are uh, defecating on standing and if that is there we should not stop treatment because invariably it will fail so they should develop habit of sitting and defecating at a certain time of the day then only we should start uh, gradually uh, reducing the drug uh, treatment and uh, and prevent the relapses by dietary modifications so toilet training is an important aspect uh, but the problem of toilet training is <clears throat> in our society we don't critically look at this when they now own children if you consider we don't think of uh, toilet training when they are grown up because most of the occasions we give the potty to the child and ask the child to pass tools on that uh, if the child develops constipation then we would look at this if sometimes you might see a patient without toilet trained at all and by the time the patient is going to attend to preschool so at that stage it's really difficult to get the habit of toilet training so uh, but in western countries actually toilet training is a big stressful event for parents uh, it has not come uh, to up to that stage in our society but when they are constipated it's really difficult to uh, get back to toilet training so we should actively look into toilet training and one important aspect is never try to train when the child is constipated when the child is constipated you can't do toilet training you have to delay it until the child is passing painless uh, stools and if the child is not having any hard stools then that is the time to start toilet training and usually by the by 18 months or so we would start it and complete it by about 3 years and never induce force when you try to do toilet training so that is the child oriented approach that is described in pediatrics always give priority to the child not to force and accept the accidents when you are doing the toilet training avoid punishments at all cost and always reward the patient always reward the child uh, when it comes to uh, toilet training and consistent approach so this is actually becoming less and less sort of practice in our society because as you all know in our own children are looked after by sometimes the the, the nannies or grandparents so you might know what to do but the, the, the indoors might not know what to do so there is no consistent approach when it comes to toilet training but it's actually everybody should know what is how to do the toilet training at home so that uh, the, the results will be, the outcome will be good so this is actually the to see how, how much the child is ready for toilet training so there are little criteria but most of the occasions when when the child is uh, having a wet wet nappy or dirty nappy they will indicate that or they will indicate the uh, the need for uh, going to go into the toilet but one important aspect is uh, uh, to identify the correct timing and then only introduce the uh, toilet training habit so that uh, constipation can be avoided this so that is the commonest time that they develop constipation so uh, 
thank you very much